what would be the most important elements in the negotiations if Russia decides to go for it? Well, Russia is not going to decide to go for it on or decide not to go for it. It's basically just waiting for some sign that uh, the West is receptive to resuming meaningful, fruitful discussions. To do that, the first step would be to reestablish trust, uh, because as it stands, uh, the West is not capable of agreement with Russia, having reneged on its previous agreements. So what is the use of Russia reaching new agreements with the West if the West isn't going to abide by the existing ones? So um, some of the existing agreements are, first of all, not an inch to the east of NATO expansion promised to Russia after Russia agreed to the reunification of Germany. And now um, NATO includes Finland and the Baltics, and uh, uh, NATO is talking about, still talking about including the Ukraine and expanding into Armenia and uh, attempting, still attempting to expand into Georgia. So what's the point of talking to, uh, to an entity that, that does that? that promises one thing and then fails to deliver. Another is that Russia has uh, demanded that the West abide by the previous agreements it made with regard to mutual security arrangements. It made those demands in November of 2021. Uh, the reaction to them was that uh, the West is pretty much willing to discuss some tangential items but will not address the fact that it reneged on promises it made in writing at international conferences. So that's pretty much where it stands. The West is uh, talking about talking, uh, but that's useless because what it has to do is abide by its previous agreements and abide by the previous promises that it has made to Russia. If it doesn't do that, then who is there to talk to? Is Europe playing any important role in this whole situation? Russia will do what it can to keep channels of communication open for uh, all sorts of reasons, minor ones, uh, basically solving very minor problems having to do with uh, issues that it, private individuals might have or business dealings that still continue in spite of all the sanctions, etc., but there isn't very much interest on Russia's side in continuing the relationship with, with Europe per se. Uh, there's still a continuing relationship with Hungary because Rosatom is building a, a Pakshtu nuclear reactor there. Um, there are various other uh, uh, bits of business that are ongoing, but overall there isn't this major thrust uh, on Russia's side to uh, to um, to further the relationship with Europe. One of the greatest miscalculation on the part of the Western countries was the economy of Russia. They thought that they can destroy the economy of Russia. How the economy of Russia has changed during this conflict in Ukraine? It's definitely changed for the better. Uh, Russia does very well under pressure. When there is no pressure, uh, there tends to be a relaxed attitude. So uh, uh, previously, there were efforts at import replacement, for instance. But until the West imposed its sanctions, it was not a strategic um, question for Russia. When it became a strategic question, suddenly uh, the Russians snapped into this forest fire mode and now have import replaced just about everything of any significance. So there is really nothing that they need from the West anymore. Uh, they're self-sufficient or they have found new partners. And the little bit that they do need to import from the West, they can do so from uh, various uh, parallel import channels through various friendly countries. Um, and. Uh, uh, the United States has has uh, been trying to plug up these uh, these leaks, these holes, but unsuccessfully, and and uh, it's it's basically a losing battle, um, and and so basically Russia at this point has assured itself 
uh, very solid economic growth, especially in the productive industries, whereas the West is rapid, rapidly deindustrializing, and uh, it it has a very bright future economically, as opposed to the West, which is basically in perpetual decline. It's past peak. Do you have any hope in Europe that they finally they can get it that their future with Russia would be brighter than what they're doing right now? I don't think it's point. I don't think there's any point in that because Europe does not have a future with Russia. Individual Europeans might have a future in Russia, but Europe per se, you know, the train has left the station, so there is no point in running down the tracks after it. Lloyd Austin was in Kiev. In your opinion, why he was there? What he was looking for? What's your speculation on that? Well, it's not speculation. It's more like a pretty solid knowledge. Um, the Ukraine is a, a major money laundry for the United States. Uh, basically, you know, the financial system of the United States is lo- not long for this world. And uh, the people involved in the, U- the U.S. government are trying to feather their nest as, as fast as they can using pay packets that they collect and, and haul back to the home base in diplomatic baggage from the Ukraine, which is why there's this basically ant trail of uh, various dignitaries unrelated to anything that the Ukraine is doing, making their way to Kiev, stuffing their suitcases with cash, and then hauling that cash back to wherever they came from. Everybody, including people like Janet Yellen, you know, they, they, they basically pay courtesy calls and each time they haul away some amount of cash, uh, which was laundered. It's basically cash, taxpayer money, that was sent to the Ukraine, laundered, turned into cash, and then some of it given back to the various European and US officials. Uh, some of it used to buy mansions in Switzerland or you know, the Maldives or, or some other place. Um, by uh, various uh, connected individuals within uh, the Ukrainian government. Some of it just simply stolen uh, by by various parties unknown to anyone. And some of it spent on, on the war effort, but not very much. Um, and that's been the pattern. So that's why they keep going there. No other reason. There is a conflict between Zelensky and Zeluzhny. What's the reason for that? Is the West trying behind the scene to replace Zelensky with Zeluzhny? What's the problem behind that, in your opinion? Well, Zelensky is uh, basically spent uh, as a public figure. And so they're trying to figure out how to replace him without suffering a huge loss of face. And so uh, Zeluzhny is more of a trial balloon because he's not very photogenic. In fact, there's nobody photogenic on the Ukrainian side at all. Uh, they're all just basically a chamber of horrors. And and uh, Zelensky was the, the last comedian that they had deployed who uh, who made a splash and, you know, uh, uh, made good good copy and, and, and uh, looked good on video, et cetera. There's nobody to replace him. And, and so they're struggling with it. But it's not like there's anybody on the Ukrainian side who actually makes decisions. You know, they make decisions on how much money to steal and who that money goes to. That's it. You know, it's it's really all about money. It's all about corruption. There's nothing else that the Ukrainian government can actually control. Do you think that at the end of the day, the West would be able to control these neo-Nazis in Ukraine? Well, that that's generally the pattern. All of these terrorist organizations that the West organizes, be it uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Ukrainian Nazis or Hamas, uh, which was organized by the Netanyahu government, um, they lose control over them. And yet they keep doing it. You know, that's that's unstoppable. They never learn their lesson. Uh, Don't play with terrorism. Uh, They just love playing with terrorists and the terrorists always get away from them. And they always uh, do uncontrollable things 
and then it falls on somebody else like Russia to to fix the problem. So it was Russia who uh, helped helped Iraq deal with Al Qaeda and with ISIS. Uh, it was Russia who helped the Taliban deal with uh, Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. Uh, it was Russia who put down ISIS in Syria, and it was it, it's going to be Russia dealing with the neo Nazis in the Ukraine. Um, you know, and, and that's the pattern. It's it's the Russian know how to deal with these uh, uh, United States organized terrorist organizations. Has this conflict in Gaza influenced the war in Ukraine? Well, yes. Basically, this this conflict pretty much stole all the oxygen from Kiev. Uh, suddenly, the little bit of uh, artillery shells coming out of American and, and Western factories couldn't go to the Ukraine anymore. It had to go to Tzahal, to Israel, to shoot at the poor Gazans. You have to keep in mind that, you know, that these are basically factories that haven't been upgraded since World War II, where uh, all the people who work there are very much retirement age and the quality of the ordnance they produce is very low. It's all stuff made out of mild steel and milled out of ingots and just basically fabrication standards that are World War II vintage. Um, they're basically light years behind where Russia is in terms of volume of production and in terms of quality of production. So this isn't going to make much of a difference for either the Ukraine or for Israel. But right now, Israel is still able to kill lots and lots of uh, unarmed Gazans. Uh, it's not really able to do anything about Hamas. Hamas is laughing, you know, destroying scores of Israeli tanks and these uh, poor Israeli soldiers who are not really trained to basically do urban warfare. You know, that's a new one for them. So they, they're losing lots of men and women, and they're losing lots of armor, and they're not really making inroads into the these tunnel networks, which are huge. And and so it's it's all a losing battle in any case. But yes, I think that the appearance of the Gaza battle has cut down the life expectancy of the Ukrainian regime by quite a lot. How was the reaction of the Netanyahu administration? Was that smart? Do you think that they could have responded in a better manner? Well, it, you have to understand that Israel is pretty much collapsing. It's caving in on itself. First of all, the, the Hamas action was actually very clever. It was a, an excellent move because here were all these Middle Eastern monarchies ready to make peace with Israel for the sake of a little bit of money. Now they're completely thwarted from doing that. They're prevented from making peace with Israel. They were going to just completely overlook and forget about the Palestinians. Now they will not be able to do that. The Palestinian question is once again, front and center. Now, you have to understand that Hamas was organized by the Israelis uh, in order to diversify the, the field, as it is, um, on the Palestinian side. And uh, lo and behold, they, they, they won the elections and are, are now the dominant force in Gaza. And because of the recent actions, their, their influence is increasing in, on the West Bank as well. And they're becoming more popular. They're they're being touted as heroes. So that's one thing to keep in mind is that Hamas is Netanyahu's baby. He made it. Uh, secondly, he now talks about or he made the promise to destroy Hamas. Well, Hamas is Gaza. It's the entire population of Gaza because it's a popular movement. It's not some little terrorist organization. It's a popular movement. It's a liberation movement. And to destroy it, you have to destroy pretty much the entire population of Gaza, which means genocide, which will spell the end of Israel as an entity that anyone will want to deal with at all anywhere in the world. Um, the other thing is that Israel pretty much slept through the event. They were supposed to have absolutely wonderful intelligence. Um, and it turns out that it doesn't exist. And then they killed a lot of their own citizens and a lot of their own soldiers through friendly fire because these helicopter crews took off, didn't know what to fire on, panicked, and just 
strafed everyone and these tanks just rolled around and any building that had Hamas in it, they thought they just shelled, uh, just completely ignoring the fact that these buildings were full of Israelis. And so uh, basically scores of Israelis, over a thousand, the exact numbers are still being argued about, were killed by the Israelis themselves. And then the entire action in Gaza, first they make the place impassable by shelling and, and bombardment, and then they roll in with tanks, and it, it's an impassable landscape, and they roll in with tanks not knowing that uh, shoulder-fired uh, anti-armor rockets are all over the place on the Hamas side. And so these these guys dressed in Adidas, you know, with shoulder-fired uh, launchers on their shoulders, pop out of the ground, destroy a tank, and then disappear underground again. So they lost lots and lots of very expensive armor. They're, now they're down to uh, to tanks that are obsolete, that they were going to dismantle or sell off. But now they're they're forced to use them. And also they're losing lots and lots of men. And they're not really conquering. You know, they're not pacifying the place. Uh, they're causing huge numbers of civilian casualties. But they're not achieving their stated goal, their objective of destroying Hamas, because it's a ridiculous objective. And in the meantime, they're making new and new enemies, new and approved enemies all over the world. The public relations campaign, as Israel has launched it, is a failure. It's it's brain dead to start with. And I recently published an article about the the brain dead. PR effort of the of the uh, Israeli regime. Um, I think the bottom line is I don't think that Israel is going to last very long. It's a public money sponge that absolutely uh, depends on uh, huge infusions of American money, and Americans are uh, fresh out of money. So uh, I think that's the end of Israel. At the end of the day. In your opinion, what would be the solution for this conflict in Gaza? We know that Russia and China and most of the countries all around the world are supporting, even the United States are supporting two-state solution. And But some people are talking about one-state solution, something like Belgium. How do you find it? Well, I find that it's the most tedious bunch of rhetoric I've ever heard. And I've heard it for the past however many years, pretty much for as long as I've been alive. And uh, it's being lip service to something that will never happen. Uh, what will happen is a one state solution and that state will be Palestine and Israel will be gone. Everybody knows that there's no, no peaceful solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem. There has been no solution ever since the British created this monstrosity called the, you know, the Jewish state, the state of Israel in Palestine on their way out. That was their passing, you know, their parting present, the poison chalice that they left to future generations in the region. Just like they, uh, the fact that they uh, split up British India into India and Pakistan, laying the groundwork for future conflict. You know, that's basically the British policy. Make sure that nothing grows, not even grass, wherever they're forced to leave. And so that's what they did. Now, everybody really knows that there is no peaceful solution. The only solution there is war. And uh, everybody knows that uh, a couple of million Israelis and uh, half a billion Arabs, uh, not, not just Arabs, but Muslims around the world, is kind of imbalanced. So here you have half a billion people who feel that this is the holy land, that Al-Aqsa is something very significant to them, third most holy place. And here is this Jewish state sitting on, sitting on top of it, pretending that it's theirs, uh, granted to them by a God that most of them don't even believe in. That's preposterous, okay? That is not going to work in the long run. Everybody knows it. So the question is, when will Americans run out of money and patience and stop funding this effort? And then and then the Jews will go off. They'll just basically go off in some direction. 
you know, one one proposed solution to the whole problem is to relocate the Israelis to the Jewish Autonomous Region, part of the Russian Federation. There's a place called the Jewish Autonomous Region. Its area is slightly larger than the area of Israel. It's on the Chinese border, strategically located. It's very nice, sitting there, more or less vacant, waiting for the Israelis to decide to go there. So why not go there? Problem solved. How do you see the role of Turkey within NATO? Do you see a bright future for NATO, considering these latest movement by Turkey? Oh, I don't see any future for NATO at all. I think NATO is a joke. So leaving NATO aside, you have to keep in mind that uh, Turkey is a Hamas supporter. Turkey is a Muslim Brotherhood supporter. It supported mu- the Muslim bro- Brotherhood when it was in power in Egypt. And, and so... Hamas is pretty much the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza. It's it's not something that, that copies any sort of a, a, a European uh, organization. Uh, it's it's really Arab communalism, uh, very different from from anything that that the Europeans can even understand. Perhaps it's it's closest in its in terms of its structure to to the Taliban, which is still after all these years of American occupation of Afghanistan, completely opaque to to the West, impossible to understand. Same thing with Hamas, but Turkey is solidly behind Hamas. It's a Hamas supporter. At the same time, Turkey trades with Israel. Israel is still receiving oil shipments from uh, another Muslim country, which is Azerbaijan, via Turkey, uh, via the Mediterranean. And that is a, a sizable portion of the, the total oil that Israel receives. Without that oil, it would not have the, the diesel to fuel up the, the armor, the tanks that roll into Gaza, that kill the Gazans. So the Turks are, as usual, playing all sides, just like they were in the Ukraine. They made a little bit of money by selling weapons to the Ukraine. They kept the channels of communication and the relationship going with Russia because they they like the Russian tourists. Uh, They like selling produce to Russia. They like the fact that Russia is building the nuclear power power plant in in Akuyu. Um, All sorts of things. You know, the, the Turks are wily. They, they they don't have anybody else's interests in mind except Turkey's. That is something that needs to be kept in mind. And and so, um, you know, this is par for the course for Turkey. It 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 can do several contradictory things at the same time. When this conflict started, the United States sent a lot of weapons to the Middle East to support Israel, even nuclear-capable weapons. And we know that Israeli minister confessed that Israel has nuclear bombs. Everybody knew that, but this is the first time an official talking about this. What would be the reaction? What would be the change that would come out of this for the Middle Eastern countries for Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, UAE, these countries don't have nuclear bombs. The only upper hand Israel has right now is these nuclear bombs. Would this motive persuade these countries or provoke these countries to go after nuclear bombs or go after a security deal with Russia and China to provide security for these countries if anything happened between Israel and these Arab states? It's a complicated question, but basically uh, you have to keep in mind that nuclear weapons are designed not to be used. That's one thing that most people get wrong about them. Their only value is as a deterrent. Now, uh, nuclear weapons are are, are a basis of various types of games of strategy, basically targeting strategy. So uh, it's really pointless uh, for Israel to have uh, nuclear weapons as a deterrent because nobody will ever attack Israel using nuclear weapons because it's too damn small. If you, if you hit Israel using nuclear weapons, then you're also hitting Lebanon. You're also hitting neighboring states. Jordan would pretty much get destroyed. 
uh, Egypt doesn't have that, that much there. You would be destroying Palestine. It's impossible to take out Israel using nuclear weapons without, without also taking out Palestine. Um, it's just completely pointless. Um, so Israeli nuclear deterrence is stupid, right? Let's cross that right off. Now, Israeli first strike against who? It can't do a first strike against anyone, really, uh, without demolishing its chances of continued existence. Because once, once it goes nuclear in a conflict, it basically loses all legitimacy as anything other than a, a failed rogue state that has to be eliminated. It has at that point, it has to be decapitated. As in, the people who made the decision have to be put to death through whatever means necessary. And at that point, the big boys, Russia, China, whoever else wants to, even the United States, has to step in and basically walk in there and kill these bastards, which in a postage stamp sized country is not very difficult if, if you're you know, a first world nation with, with first class weapons. You know, it's just not a challenge. So ha Israel having nuclear weapons, it doesn't really help the cause of nuclear non-proliferation on the other hand, it's just one of those very stupid things that the Israelis have done. One of many stupid things. I don't think it's really a make or break sort of thing. I think it's just a nuisance. How do you see the role of Biden administration right now in Gaza? Are they trying to convince the Netanyahu administration to find some sort of off ramps? Well, there, there are a few things there. First, uh, the Israelis aren't even listening to the Biden administration. They're, they The Israelis believe that they have enough clout in the U.S. Congress and in the halls of power in Washington to get their agenda, agenda pushed through no matter what. So basically, they don't even have to uh, pretend to be playing nice. That's their feeling. Secondly, there isn't really a lot of support that the U.S. can grant to Israel at this point. Uh, they, they've already done the little bit that they, they can. You know, they 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 have uh, um, they 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 have uh, an aircraft carrier group steaming pointlessly around the Mediterranean. What's it doing there? Nobody knows. Uh, it can't really fight, as as everybody knows, because it's a sitting dunk. Anybody can can sink it, if you know, using the upgraded weapons that exist and the modern weapons, it can just be sunk. So it really can't can't get into harm's way, and the fact that it's there means that it's not going to be used. It's just there to show the flag and do nothing. Any time that a U.S. Um, aircraft carrier shows up somewhere, it means that there isn't going to be a war there. Um, what else can it do? Well, it, it uh, shipped the shells that it was supposed to ship to uh, to the Ukraine. It shipped those to Israel, and those were used to de to demolish a bunch of buildings in Gaza. Well, la di da, you know what? What good did that do? Well, it. Uh, it made a bunch of civilians homeless. Is that a strategic victory of any sort for anyone? I don't think so. What else can the U.S. do? Nothing. So it really doesn't matter. You know, it's just, it's just one of those things. Uh, you know, the U.S. will continue to support Israel without actually being able to support Israel until Israel ceases to exist. Just to wrap up this session, Dimitri, I want to talk about BRICS. One of the new members of BRICS, Argentina, here in Latin America, they're having a new president. He wants to get out of BRICS. He wants to cut ties with Russia, with Brazil, with China. Let's talk about the situation of Argentina right now. What led Argentina to these difficulties that they are experiencing right now that finally led to the winning of this guy, this strange guy? I haven't really kept track of Argentina that much because it's it's just really painful to watch. 
I mean, these people dance a fine tango, but as far as anything having to do with economics, forget it. You know, they should just stick to tango and football and forget everything else because they they're bad at it. And they're particularly bad at at electing public officials. They shouldn't even have a democracy. They should just basically have somebody, a governor, you know, who who will establish keep law and order in the place. Because there's just no good at it, you know. Uh this this guy is a, an absolute clown. And a last ditch effort to pretend Argentina from going with with bricks and and maybe using that as a way to get its house in order. Um, a disruptive sort of influence. I would say that he's a, basically, he's another clown. He's a Zelensky 2.0, you know, but he he's sort of an unfunny clown. Um, and uh, I think he's going to crash and burn in very short order. You know, in the, in the Argentine, in the Argentine Senate, I think he has uh, seven people on his side, which is not enough to pass any legislation. And the way he's been behaving, I don't think anybody wants to be in a coalition with him. I don't think any sane party would want to throw its its chances in with, with this clown. So basically, Argentina is uh, at an impasse, but that's not the first time, you know, that Argentina is without a useful government, you know, it's very typical of it. It's basically just a, a shambles of a country and it's going to continue that way. You know, like I said, they should just stick to tango and football and that's it. How do you see these new countries that are willing to join BRICS? What potential they would add to BRICS? Oh, I don't think that BRICS as such um, is, is a you know, a power-based organization. It's a know-how-based organization. And that know-how is basically how to get rid of toxic currencies, uh, dollar and euro, how to make your trade relationships with uh, with other BRICS members in particular opaque to everybody in the West, to, to the IMF, the World Bank, um, the the United States Treasury Department in particular, um, uh, various uh, Western and U.S. based ratings agencies, how to basically go dark and continue to have very good trade relationships with other BRICS members. That is very appealing, and that is the the know how that BRICS membership offers, um, and that's what attracts people. They know that, you know, they have to stop using the U.S. dollar and the euro. They absolutely know this. Uh, they know that just use, starting to use the yuan for everything or the Russian ruble is just not a solution. They know that they have to uh, work out trade relationships using their own currencies. That is tricky. That requires quite a bit of groundwork and, and special software and all sorts of things. And that's the BRICS know-how.